2023 general elections might not hold due to the current insecurity plaguing the country. And former Senate President Ayim Pius Ayim sends an open letter to President Buhari saying that the search for a solution to Nigeria's problems must involve all citizens. All well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cole. There are increasing fears that the 2023 general polls might not hold due to the insecurity plaguing the country. Other reasons include agitation for secession by some parts of the country and the insistence by many groups and leaders that the country must be restructured for fiscal, uh, with fiscal and other powers devolved to the federating units before this election can hold. In addition, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, said that the attacks on its offices could derail the general elections. Well, joining us to have this conversation is Opunabo Inko Tare. He's a former special advisor to the River State Governor. And, of course, we're being joined by Dennis Amakri. He is a former assistant director uh, in the Department of State Services. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for having Thank you, Marianne, and good evening. Great. Um, the, the, there are very interesting questions that I want to start asking, but I, I want to start by talking about the level of insecurity that is facing the country. Um, Mr. Macri, I'm sure that you're almost sick of being asked questions as to how we can turn around the situation of insecurity in the country. You seem to be, I mean, I think it's now a day job for you to sit in front of a camera or be talking on a radio station as to how bad the situation is. Um, as at yesterday, we, um, there were several killings. In fact, in Calabar, a man was stabbed in the back of his head and dumped by, uh, on the, by the highway. Uh, as at today, there was a report that a female journalist was being kidnapped and her six-month-old baby was left behind. So there seems to be everybody, literally everybody, even those of us who think we're safe, are not necessarily safe. And what does that say for a country where our president sits uh, over ECOWAS. Our president seems to be the big brother who's visiting other countries and asking for peace, but our backyard is literally on fire. Uh, we have a big problem in our hands. Uh, I think Nigeria actually is at the crossroads right now. And um, it's a situation where if we don't handle it properly right now, you know, we're going to tip off uh, on the precipice. So, um, you know, these issues, which are the fundamental issues, uh, issues uh, of threats to national security, the, the um, should I say, the root causes that have been bothering us need to be addressed. Because apparently we are trying to um, address symptoms without going to the root causes. And without the root causes, I think we'll just be going around in circles. So um, every day we talk about it. And then, of course, they wanted the new service chiefs. We've got the new service chiefs. And uh, of course, like we have always said, um, you cannot put a new wine in an old bottle and uh, hope that it will be the same. So I think the right time uh, for the government to do right now is to sit back I think, I think that's what they are doing in, the, in Abuja right now. Um, I think this is the second day of the meeting. Sit back and then, of course, go to the drawing board. Uh, the Minister for Defense have said that Nigeria is bleeding. And uh, if it is bleeding, then I think it's high time we go to the emergency room and call all the specialist doctors to go in there and look at what is going on and how to stop the bleeding. Uh, I mean, this seems to, I mean, we're all beginning to sound like broken records, of course. I, and I, for an outsider looking in, I was talking to some of my friends in D.C. yesterday, and they were all just asking the same question, that there seems to, it's like the answers to our, uh, our problem uh, is literally in front of us, but we're looking beyond it to look for solutions that may not necessarily be available to us. I mean, before now, we had been calling on Mr. President to address these issues that have 
Because as far as I'm concerned, these were very little issues that have spiraled out of control, and now we cannot deal with them. We're needing to have call meetings and, you know. So why, did you, why do you think it took so long for the presidency to realize? Was it that he did not know? Is it that he did not understand how the problem, because you kept saying that if we, until we deal with the source of the problem, but we knew what the source of the problem was. Why couldn't we take out that source early enough? Why did we have to wait till now that it's becoming a national issue, which is threatening the fibers of, of this country? You know, like when you look at it, sometimes you listen to uh, the presidential advisors or the spokesmen who come out to tell us, you know, uh, majorly things that are contrary because they are reading either the body language of the president or they are not informing him properly. And then, of course, when we listen to them, we find out that there is this gap between them and what people are feeling. Because it is simple. What Nigeria is going through right now is a serious bleeding. And then, of course, people are scared. Nobody is safe. Before, people thought that it was going to be in the Northeast. But right now, I think uh, even in Lagos here, yeah, you know, good state, people are being kidnapped. In the South-South, people are being kidnapped. So what are we going to do about this? We are for, you know, avoidance of something like broken records. Of course, we have to look at those root causes. And those root causes will require people sitting down and coming up with new ideas on how to tackle, tackle this particular problem. OK. Let me go to you, Mr. Punaboy Kotaria. Um, there have been several fears um, that, I mean, increasing threats to uh, the general polls and fears that the election may not hold. Now, the reasons were listed as increasing wave of insecurity, just as Mr. Macri has said, um, a climate of violence, agitation for secession by some parts of the country, and insistence by many group, uh, groups and their leaders that the country must be restructured with fiscal and other powers devoted to federating units, just as I said at the beginning of this conversation. Do you hold the same view? If we apply this, would we be able to solve Nigeria's problem in the interim? Well, talking of holding the same view, I'll tell you yes, because um, the presidency or the federal government is just floundering in the morass of approaches. Forget the high blood pressure of the Central Electorate and an enemy of concrete performance. That's all we see. Our political engine is overheated. Social climate, exceedingly inflammatory, and economic atmosphere highly composed. And so we are headed slowly but steadily for a rendezvous with anarchy. And except something is done, we are faced with intricate, complex problems. And I felt something is done and done expeditiously. And not this um, delusion, this strategy being employed. First and foremost, I will tell you that the federal government is complicit in all that is going on. How so? I said complicit and I have all the facts. I have all the facts to bolster my fashion. If you allow me, first, they deceived Nigerians. The former service chief deceived Nigerians when they said, they have contained, they have decimated, they use all kinds of adjectives such as strategically, um, tactically, and what have you. But when the chief of staff was removed, the uh, chief of army staff was removed from office, and his incompetence and mediocrity rewarded with ambassadorial appointment, he was the same person who said it will take over 20 years or thereabouts to contain the insurgents. That is the contradiction of that. Why did you initially deceive Nigeria that these people have been contained? Now you are telling us that it will take about 20 years or thereabouts. So there is no insincerity. You have a schizophrenic personality as a government. You cannot trust what they say. That is one aspect of it. You also have the issue of the defense minister who said, it, I told me it was a freedom slip, because it wasn't an arranged, a pre-arranged interview, who said that Nigerians should defend themselves, as loony as that is. Nigerians who are unarmed should defend themselves against armed people who have weapons that are even more sophisticated than the army. Diffidence, loss of their despondent, loss of hope. 
That is the second aspect of it. Then, then hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay, can. Sorry, you just took the line, but the, the girl will come up. This is the country we need. Okay, so that is it again. Then we have the issue of the Gumi. The Gumi's issue should not be treated with levy. He was not mandated by the federal government at any point in time to liaise with these people. As at when Gumi spoke with them, they were terrorists, declared terrorists, and declared one. Gumi went ahead, spoke with them, came back, even said. But Mr. But Mr. But, 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 but Mr. Tarya, Mr. Tarya, I'm sorry, just, just hold on, just hold on. I, I'm, not, I'm not in any way making a case for okay. Gumi because I have spoken with the man. Um, if there was not um, some form of an opening, there would not be a Gumi. If, if, if we had a government that was functioning, if our security agencies were doing their job as they should, no, there would not be you, there would not be you, an yeah, opportunity for a Gumi why, why to, the, to why intervene. Gumi has to be grilled by the security. There was, yeah, and I'll tell you why Gumi has to be grilled by the security. Let me tell you why Gumi has to be grilled by the security. Now, you remember the president, even before he became a president, said if the United Delta United Delta could be granted amnesty, the military, why not the Boko Haram? And though they are using Gumi is only a decoy. What they are using is Gumi. Gumi is actually voicing, saying what the presidency wants. He is calling on behalf of the president. Well, so I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'd have to come in there. I'm bandit. sorry. The president is not here to defend bandit. themselves. Bandit. We yes. cannot. It's not written anywhere. We have not heard the presidency say that Gumi is speaking for them or he's no, saying no, or speaking their minds. Of speak, course. Action speaks action speak louder than words. And it is our meaning is not in the message, but in the message user. It is our right to infer. And that is why you have to be as transparent as possible. Because it is our right to infer as citizens. And we have a president that is taciturn, that does not talk. He's only talking through his advisors, through his lieutenants, through his lead men. And if that is the case, then let, we can also infer, we can also extrapolate from the situation. That is what, and that is why we are educated. That is why we, we went to school. So that is our right. So um, if you don't want any discussion in the channel, then come out and address Nigeria. Hmm. Well, this is a question I'm, I want to throw back to you, uh, Mr. Macri. Yes, this is yes. obviously a slap on the face of security um, of forces, I mean, security apparatuses that we have in this country, and you used to be part of it. He's making a case that, you know, if, if there were no loopholes to be plugged, there would not be a gummy. And then there still is a gummy who's going about, especially in the case of the Pantami situation, he has also been spitting a lot of fire where Nigerians have been criticizing him. So again, just to re-echo what Inkotari is saying, why are people like Gumi walking free in a situation as dicey and sensitive as this? Well, you know that um, uh, the antecedents of Gumi, uh, Sheikh Gumi, uh, are well documented, very well documented, and the security agencies are very familiar with him. You know, and they've had running battles. Even when I was in service, you know, we've had running battles with Gumi. And we know the kind of statements that he made. In fact, he was one of the apologies of uh, apologists of uh, Boko Haram. You know, and uh, if you look at it, that's how he is. Uh, some of these people, uh, you know, they, they, they pray that the government should come and even arrest them so that they can be more popular than what they are, you know. So um, uh, it is not a situation where the security agencies will now start pursuing you around. They will keep an eye on him uh, and uh, see what he's also planning to do. Um, really, we should uh, wait to see what he plans to do, if he has plans. I mean, there's all, um, already enough damage that's been done to us by these so-called bandits. And Boko Haram, not to talk about them, they're already on one hand causing mayhem. They have hoisted a flag close to the FCT. What are we waiting for exactly? I, I think uh, he has plans because for him to come and say that um, uh, the amne you know, there should be amnesty for the bandits. You know, bandits are criminals. I don't know whichever name anybody wants to call them. They are criminals. They don't have a leader that is identifiable. They go around and kill people. And then, of course, you cannot compare them to the Niger Delta militants. Because, of no, course, no, no, everybody no. knows what the Niger Delta militants stand for. In fact, everybody knows up to the extent that the president 
of Nigeria at that time have to come out and uh, declare amnesty for them. And then, of course, entered into certain agreements with them. So we cannot compare these people that are busy uh, raising down uh, human life, women and children, killing, and all kinds of things. You know, and these are bandits. Bandits are criminals. Let so me... this is the problem that we are having. Um, we thought, um... When you look at it, it shows that the man has other plans. He has um, other to... plans. Okay, Mr. So, so Mr. Mr. Inkotara, go uh, ahead. My elder brother, Dan, is just said. We must, we, we must have that distinction between banditry and militants. A militant is not a criminal. A militant is one really? who wants to use social or really? political force to... I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, really? Sorry, a, a militant is not a criminal? Yeah. Abducting people, is that not criminal and asking for ransom? And, and no, 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 no. We are talking of Niger Delta militants. They were and, the then, and they're not amnesty. criminal? They did not grant criminals amnesty. In every society, you have the criminal. And you have people exploiting situations. And in the case of the Niger Delta struggle, I call it a struggle, so much was triggered out of the system with, with the region with little or nothing to show for it. We are inhaling pernicious air. We were being killed on a daily basis. And most of the sicknesses defied medical uh, uh, research. So we said no. We did not vent our spleen on any other region. We did not carry out our anger on any other person. We just said you can no longer come to our territory to explore and exploit. But, and but do you agree? But do, do you agree, Mr. Tarrier, no, that, no, 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 that there were certain no, no, people no, no, who took advantage no, of the situation no, and, no, and, and and carried no, out criminal no, activities? No, 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 do you agree no, that there were people no, no, who took advantage no, of this no, struggle no, to carry out criminal activities? Do you agree? Yes. Sorry? Do you agree that in this struggle that you are referring to, there were people who took advantage of the situation and carried out criminal activities? Do you agree? I, I, just, I just said people exploited it. Great. Just like the NSAS, people exploited it. Great. In, even in government, people exploit situations, and that's why you have corruption and fraud. Even in government, in every society, Satan exploited the situation in heaven. And that was why it was sent down, Lucifer. So you, you, you cannot rule that out. In every, it is there, but that does not vitiate the whole excess of the struggle. It doesn't negate it. That's the point that, in this particular way, what are they fighting for? It's an egocentric war. These are insurgents. You cannot, even the Constitution forbids it. You cannot force your religion, talk about the Boko Haram, on any other person. You cannot force your belief on any other person. Okay. They even talk of the heads. It is a way of trying to take over, Islamize the country. That is what is going on. Okay. They said that people did not go to the north to destroy anybody. They didn't do that. Mm. Okay. Let me post the next question because we're talking about the elections holding or not. And as we know, parties, yeah, political yeah. parties in the country have been aligning and realigning themselves. Um, but then something has been happening recently it might not be on a large scale but it's happening in on a small scale first it was a quibom state where um you know the uh, INEC offices were burned and and it's beginning to you know look like um INEC offices are being targeted and my question is why target these uh, i mean INEC offices why target this ballot boxes what exactly could be uh, the the undertone of this i mean is are these things random or I mean, as a politician, what do you think this is they're all angling at? Uh, first and foremost is to make a point. It's a referendum of the people's disapproval of the system. So we are talking of collateral damage. And what they're trying to do is target those institutions that will anoint the government. You know, if you are fighting a war, they say like you are trying to kill a snake. You don't just fight the snake, you kill it. If you have a problem with it, then you see it. Otherwise... So they want to carry out acts that will impact heavily on the federal government. So they go for the elections. First and foremost, a lot of people don't have confidence in our electoral system. And this is a pent up feeling, an outburst, a spasm of a feeling that has been in them. So they're trying to vent it. They say, okay, first let us run our spin on this election. Let us go to the police. Of course, we are aware of the answers matter. So if you observe, you observe. They've been, like Imo said, they targeted the government house. And I want to tell you that the belief is that the, the, Imo, the government of Imo State was not elected by them, but was imposed on them by the Supreme Court. That is the truth. So if you understand this, as they keep targeting those areas that they think 
are the problems in this country. So the election is a major problem. The police a major problem. In fact, the police is, uh, is about 40% of the problem we have in this country. Then you have recently Hopus of Zima. So they go to this. These ones are not targeted by the headsmen. No. These are targeted by individuals that are aggrieved, that are perturbed, individuals that are tribulated. These ones are targeted by them, not by the headsmen. So it's a referendum of the disapproval of a system, of a government, and that is what is going on. Okay, back to you, Mr. Macri. Uh, still talking security and how this might affect the elections come 2023. Um, there have been, just as he has said, because we've not been able to deal with the major violence, um, violent things that have been happening across the country, we've not been able to nip the issue of Boko Haram, nor the banditry or herdsmen uh, in the board. People are now taking advantage of this to cost more. It's becoming a free for all. Uh, does this not, one way or the other, show that our government is weak and that weakness is being taken advantage of? And who's to say that it might just not get worse in the coming days? Well, um, from our risk analysis that we've carried out among uh, security uh, practitioners, uh, we have a projection that yeah, if things continue the way they are, we don't think there will be an election in 2023 because all the indices are pointing negatively to that. Now, you see, one thing is that the Nigerian politician believes that democracy is elections. But that is not what democracy is all about. Uh, because many people will see that um, it is going in there, uh, running for the election, winning by any other means. And then, of course, when they are imposed, then they go ahead and do what they want to do. But I think Nigerians are very, very worried and sick and tired of all this. You know, I don't see anybody actually going out to say that. In fact, I don't, I don't see anybody campaigning. Because if many people campaign, most politicians will be stoned if, if they go out at this time to say they want to, you know, campaign. Mr. Macri, but they are. They are strategizing. In fact, the APC scribe, as at today's, um, as at today's early morning news cycle, was boasting about how many millions of people that they've been able to get into their political party when the people in the country are not safe. So I'm trying to understand what the APC, which is the party that is ruling, is prioritizing <laughs> at a time you like to, this. You have, understand, you have to understand that how many people are members of the APC as compared to the total population of Nigeria, you know, or how many people even vote during the elections as compared to the total population of Nigeria. So it is a mind's game. People are playing the mind's game, thinking that, you know, uh, as we get nearer to it, uh, we will start and then, of course, we will win and uh, rule for 50 more years or something like that. But the point is that, you see, if the country is not safe, if, if it is not conducive, you know, you cannot hold elections. And in fact, the Niger State governor has come out to tell us that Boko Haram has got to put their flag in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Niger. Eh? And then, of course, you remember when uh, Jonathan, uh, former President Jonathan has to go ahead and even bring mercenaries to clear the place so that elections can be held. And now that is by the corner of the country. This mm. time, we have the flag right in the middle of the country. So we have to be very, very careful. Mm. I don't know how they're going to do it, but we need to solve this problem before we can go forward. Well, finally, uh, Mr. Inkotaria, is there an end in sight? Is there something, do, do you perceive, like we say in Nigeria, the body language of the presidency and uh, the leadership of this country? Is there an end in sight? Are we soon going to heave a sigh of, a sigh of relief or are we just going to be back in our tents hoping that, you know, the bullet doesn't hit us next? Well, we'll be batting on this uh, city weekend if we continue like this. To me, I keep saying it. The panacea to our problem is restructuring. Bodu Vivendi. We must agree on whether we are going to remain as one 
And if we are to remain as one, how? In other words, let us go back to the various uh, uh, commissions of inquiry, to the various uh, national conferences. We had the act of good luck, Jonathan. We also had one that is, was being shared by Air and so on. We conflict them, reduce, add, and come up with a workable document because a lot of people believe there's so much manacle segregation and change discrimination in the system. A lot of people believe that they are not part of this system. They are not part of this country. They have a marginal life. And you must placate them. You must give them that impression that they are part of this country. That is one. Two, we must practice federalism. We are not practicing. People say true federalism. I say there is no thing as true federalism. It's either you're practicing federalism or you're not practicing federalism. Where we have a central federal system of government as against a central federal system of government. Mm. Once we are start practicing these things, I tell you, we are on the right track. Okay. There might be hope for us. Okay. There might be hope for us. Well, I want to say thank you to you. Open Aboyin Kotara is a former special advisor to the River State Governor and uh, Mr. Dennis Amakri, former you. director of the DSS. Thank you for speaking with us, gentlemen. We appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank well, we'll much. take a short break, and when we return, the PDP suggests a solution to the insecurity plaguing the country right now. And of course, an open letter has been written to Mr. President by the former Senate President. We'll get to find out what he said. Stay with us.